Welcome to the uh, quarterly financial planning webinar. It's one of the uh, series we do each quarter, uh, one month of the quarter, uh, we do a financial planning oriented webinar. And toward the beginning of the quarter, we do an economic and market outlook webinar related to our portfolio outlook. Um, today is August 24th. Uh, I'm Chris Boyd, thanks for being with us. And uh, our program uh, is going to be pretty full. I wanna just remember to mention that, um, you know, the recording, the webinar is being recorded and uh, your participation com implies consent should you uh, verbally ask a question or chat uh, with a question. Uh, in terms of compliance, there'll be some longer uh, compliance notes at the end, but keep in mind that uh, opinions are subject to change, though information uh, has been derived from sources thought to be reliable. Our uh, speakers today are our team of uh, financial planning uh, advisors at um, Asset Management Resources. Uh, we will be hearing from Scott Birmingham, our lead financial planner and chief compliance officer, Mike Perna, who is a longtime advisor with us, then the two Jeffs, uh, who are the, the newer of the advisors with us, but been here over a year now, almost a year and a half, I think, probably around that, uh, Jeff Perry, uh, JD, and uh, Jeff Tamanang, who has uh, numerous uh, financial planning credentials as well. So thank you all for being with us. Um, let me just give our audience a sense of what we will be uh, addressing today. Uh, our agenda is to um, start with a little bit of talking about some varying market conditions. Uh, we intend to address um, the importance of having a financial plan and how that can uh, help you handle some of the volatile markets that uh, come with uh, being invested. We'll also talk about some financial planning strategies for today. Uh, given the volatility, and a little bit of an outlook for the future. We'll have time for questions at the end, but uh, should you want to ask a question, you are uh, welcome to write something in the Q&A session, um, at the Q&A uh, box. There's also a chat feature, um, or if you prefer, you can raise your hand and uh, there's a possibility we'll be able to uh, unmute your, your uh, sound so you can ask the question verbally. Um, the webinar is being posted to our website and uh, YouTube channel later today. So again, keep in mind, if you are participating, you will be recorded and, and a part of that. Um, change, things can change quickly in uh, the world we're in today. So we encourage you to continue to uh, keep up with our latest thoughts through our podcast and radio show, uh, and that can help keep you current. Thought we'd start with something a little bit uh, entertaining today, a little bit fun. Um, Kathy, uh, our marketing person said, let's make it a little more engaging. Um, let's have a, a poll. So uh, this is gonna be the kind of question you're gonna have, You know, which of these is, um, the, the gray circles is larger. And um, uh, yes, the, pa the panelists can participate. Uh, I have a question from uh, one of our panelists that you certainly can. So in any case, uh, that's an example to participate in uh, the kind of questions we're gonna have. There's only just a couple of them. We'll do that in just a moment, but here's what you need to do. Uh, if you have a cell phone, um, you can uh, use this QR code and it'll bring you right to the questions. Um, and uh, you know, it'll, it'll give you a, a, a website to tap. Alternatively, if you prefer, you can, uh, you can go to uh, menti.com and use this code uh, 87417177. Okay, so here's our first question. Um, which gray bar is longer? And um, let me just to make sure if you need a chance to uh, make sure you, you got a chance to participate, use this QR code, uh, point your camera on your cell phone at it, uh, tap the uh, button that arises, it'll bring you to the website. You'll be able to participate in the, the poll right away. Okay, so um, we've got, 
answers so far. The which of the gray bars is longer? Um, the one in back is uh, so far the uh, the winning question. Um, but only two participants so far. So I'm a little concerned people might not be able to find it. Uh, I'm going to give you the uh, the QR code again if you'd like to participate. And in any case, uh, we'll move on if not. Um, so here we go. Um, that's the answer to the first one. Um, there we go. We've got a few more. Uh, and let me... Uh, See if I can get to the next page. There we go. And uh, are the gray lines parallel, yes or no? See if we get any responses there. Okay. It's pretty evenly tied on this uh, response here. Very good. Okay, oh, uh, <laughs> no seems to have the consensus. Not a lot of participants, but that's fine. You get the point. The What, what I'm trying to convey here is the idea that sometimes uh, perceptions can mislead us. It appears as though the uh, the larger circle is uh, the one on the left. It appears that the line in the front, uh, sorry, in the back is larger. It appears that the horizontal lines are not parallel. This is uh, from some resources from uh, Morningstar that we, we uh, pro provided us this. Uh, but you can see uh, after a little closer look, we can be deceived by our perceptions. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is just as it relates to our, our thoughts about markets, oftentimes we can be led astray by some of the things that we're focused on. We may not always see things as they actually are because we can sometimes uh, be uh, confused by uh, the way things actually appear. So in any case, um, let's, let's jump into some additional thoughts. There are varying investment conditions uh, with markets and let's, let's talk about that. This was a little bit older uh, um, item that First Trust uh, produced a couple years back, talking about uh, the uh, bull markets and bear markets. And the average uh, bull market is about six and a half years, a little longer, whereas the typical bear market is a little longer than a year, 1.3 years. Um, what's relevant to keep in mind here is that the magnitude is far different. It's typically uh, much more significant for the upside from bull markets than the depths of the bear markets. Um, so, you know, these are uh, things to keep in mind when we're worried about volatile times. When it comes to asset classes, um, you know, there's varying degrees of risk in different kinds of investments. When we look at, uh, this is provided also through a Morningstar uh, resource uh, created by Financial Fitness Group. Uh, they uh, indicate here clearly that over a prolonged period of time, you know, since 1926 to 2021, through that, uh, small company stocks have averaged over 12%. But the degree of volatility one endures is far greater. And similarly, large cap stocks, uh, you know, have a historic uh, average of around 10%, but the degree of volatility is wide. Um, we will have to endure some down times. As you go further across when it comes to the bonds, uh, less return, but more narrow degrees of volatility. And then of course, when we look at cash with treasury bills, far more stable, uh, but still some modest level of volatility, but not a whole lot of return. This is another way to visualize this when looking at the, the standard deviation relative to the return. You know, just given time, there's significant degrees of volatility that can come with these different investment classes, but uh, more return given sufficient time to overcome the volatility. 
Um, one of the things that comes up quite often is people want to sidestep volatility. They think, you know, maybe I'd be better served if I just sat to the sidelines from a ton to ton. And the challenge is it's very difficult to know how to time that well. And it's very easy to miss out on some of the best days when we try to avoid some of the worst days. This is a slide uh, excerpt from Putnam, uh, which uh, illustrates the point. Um, if you had missed out on the period from uh, the end of 20, 2006 to the end of 2021, if you'd uh, missed out on the best 10 days, your performance is drastically different as a percentage. It's about cut in half as a dollar amount. It's even more so. Similarly, if you miss the best 20 days, uh, returns are even more substantially impaired. You get the point as we go through this, uh, you know, just by missing the best 30 days, you can end up uh, going from significant positive returns to negative returns. It is very difficult to time the market. And uh, we would encourage investors to recognize that, again, this is another Putnam slide, uh, there are inevitably worries that will cause markets to be volatile. There will be always unexpected uh, events that can move markets. But given time, there is a favorable trajectory that has historically been the case. And given time, you're likely better served to ride things out. Now, keep in mind as well, we at AMR, for our discretionary clients, are doing uh, active allocation and we are taking actions with uh, adjustments on the edges of how to structure your portfolio given varying economic and market dynamics. But we don't necessarily want to be trying to uh, uh, time the market by getting in and out, uh, swing all in, all out. We're trying to do this within the scope of everyone's uh, designed uh, risk profile. Now, uh, I'm going to invite Jeff Perry to join me uh, for the next comment. Uh, in addition to perceptions and getting some long-term perspective, there are times when people can be led astray with uh, their, their more recent concerns. Absolutely, Chris. And psychology plays into the decisions that we make, including our investment decisions. And one of the psychological components to investing is called the recency bias. And that's really just placing too much emphasis on experience events, the television perhaps, you're watching all the bad news, you're watching all the commentators, you're just being inundated with bad news and you start to believe that that news is gonna continue forever. And so, you know, we can take where we are right now in the market cycle. Um, so far in 2022, we've S&P as measured by the S&P, it's down 13%. But if you look back, as Chris was indicating on one of the previous slides to say, for example, in this graphic, the last five years, the return annualized would have been 11.58%. So this can be a positive or negative bias. You know, when the market's at your top, you hear every, everyone in the supermarket almost, everyone, all your neighbors saying, boy, the market's so high, I got to get in. And when the market's at the bottom, you hear people saying, I got to get out, I can't take it anymore. So don't, the theme of the slide and the lesson here is don't let what's happening right now stray you from your long-term plan or encourage you to make the wrong decisions at the wrong time. I think that's a great point is if you think about only what's happening in the moment, you can be led astray. If you look at things over a longer term perspective, five years is a good example, looking back, looking forward, you might have a very different approach to things. Let's uh, bring in, thanks, Jeff. Let's bring in uh, Scott Birmingham to talk a little bit about the importance of uh, having a financial plan. Scott? Thanks, Chris. So uh, studies have shown that people who have taken the time to plan a well thought out roadmap for the retirement and have a financial plan in place have a much greater peace of mind around their finances. So they are able to better weather volatility in the market they know they are prepared for emergencies, um, unexpected expenses. They have a better understanding of their cash flow and their financial security. And planning helps to reduce overall stress and essentially helps you address important issues that maybe you wouldn't discuss on your own. 
So the questions on the right are some of the things we go through with folks. Why are you investing? Is it uh, to save for your retirement, save for the kids, take care of your spouse if you're not around? Whole host of questions go through a financial plan. Go next, Chris. So a comprehensive plan is going to cover all the basics, such as your expenses, taxes, your portfolio, any debt you might have, but also goals, vacations, gifting to the kids, possibly your alma mater. Some folks consider relocating to warmer weather or home improvements. We try to address all these concerns and then some things that you may not have thought of. So the two greatest areas of discussion in 2022 has obviously been inflation and investments. Uh, I point them out to address how they are factored into your plan. Well, we can stress test a plan a host of different ways, but the primary tool for gauging your portfolio in relation to your income and your expenses is what we call a Monte Carlo simulation. That involves running 1,000 different scenarios, or as I like to express it, running 1,000 different lifetimes. So for example, if you were to retire at 65 and we projected you live to age 95, we would run 1,000 different scenarios for that 30 year period. So the Monte Carlo feature will run random rates of return for your portfolio. Again, that's based on your specific portfolio. So you may be 50% stocks, 50% bonds, 60% stocks, 40%. So it's gonna be based on your specific portfolio, uh, which I'll show on the next screen kind of an example. But the chart on the screen here on the right there is really meant to show the variation of a thousand different tests. So up and down years, there'll be scenarios where the market does great within that 30, uh, 30 year retirement. There will be average return scenarios in there. And there'll be scenarios with extended negative market years, all to stress test your portfolio. So when I say the simulations are varied, this is uh, just kind of a visual. So your retirement projections might start where the market performs similarly to say uh, 2000, where it's down 10% one year, 13% the next year, and 23% uh, the next year. So that might be one simulation. Uh, another simulation, it could be something similar to 2005, where the market was up only 3% and uh, 13% the next year, and then about 3.5% the next year. So kind of modest. So I was just trying to represent and show you how possibly uh, all these different variations. So these are just three possible scenarios of maybe where your portfolio starts out with. But it's going to run 1,000 of those. And then, of course, inflation is factored into these projections as well. Obviously, today's inflation numbers are extremely high and out of the norm. And I don't need to stress how difficult that could be on your day-to-day -day cash flow. I include this slide merely to reiterate, uh, reiterate the effect inflation has on all your expenses in retirement. Even with historically average inflation numbers of say two and a half to 3%, which you'll see on the little graph on the bottom left, uh, you can see your expenses double were you to live into your 90s. And you can see that uh, they'll go up almost 50% over 15 to 17 years. And that's just at average inflation rates. So just I've just put it in there, one, to say, you know, the effect of inflation, and two, the fact that we are factoring that into your plans. Which leads me to withdrawals of cash flow. In this example, the person needs $90,000 annually in retirement. So we have this person getting a Social Security benefit, which most folks do. After age 72, you're required to take required minimum distributions. That's that RMD box. And then some people also have a pension. So in this scenario, at the start of the year, this person will pretty much know what they'll be receiving every month for that particular year for their Social Security RMD and pension. Uh, that's totaling in this scenario about 65,000. In a typical year, the client may be withdrawing that additional 25,000 of need from their portfolio. Normally, that would be coming from a low risk portion of the portfolio, maybe a 30% stock, 70% bond portfolio uh, piece. 
But in conversations we've had with folks this year, we've been talking to clients about possibly taking money from their liquid cash rather than the portfolio. Now the market's had a nice recovery over the past month, but it's still down. So this is still a viable conversation. We typically stress that a client have one to three years of expenses in liquid cash anyways, um, for emergencies, unexpected purchases. And in this case, you know, maybe using it a down market year to uh, instead of pulling money out of your portfolio, you, know, you take money out of cash. Now, this may not work for every client, but if you have the available cash, you may want to consider either replacing or reducing your portfolio withdrawals. So obviously, if you don't have a plan in place, I would stress that you reach out and let us help you with the process. If you have completed a plan, you can contact us to review it and see what effect, if any, this year's market performance has had on your probability of success. A financial plan is not a static thing uh, where we hand you a 50 page book and send you on your way. Things will change over the course of your retirement and the plan should be reviewed from time to time. Uh, in addition, if you don't have access to our planning program, Right Capital, you can email me and I can provide you access. But every time you open up the program now, you would be seeing a snapshot similar list where uh, your probability of success is updated. Uh, you'll see your net worth. You get a basic balance sheet. Um, you don't have to be a numbers person or a financial planner to get some benefit out of this program. So I would recommend everybody um, get access to it. It's pretty simple. Scott, naturally, um, it would be reasonable for uh, the snapshot to look a little worse when markets are down and a little better as they recover, though, correct? Sure. So every time you run the simulation, it is doing it from your portfolio apps today. So if it, your portfolio is up, the numbers are a little better, portfolio is down, might look a little less, but uh, won't, typically not dramatic moves because, again, we're projecting over a long time frame. Great. Thanks. I think we had one other thought here for people to keep in mind, just as a consequence of something that had come up recently. Um, might be a good idea to review beneficiaries. Did you want to comment on that, Scott? Yeah, it was, it was, it was a, a discussion we had about a client uh, who was expecting to receive an inheritance and the account was not set up properly as far as beneficiaries. So Right Capital has this feature in there so I know we have a lot of clients who have a lot of different bank accounts, uh, accounts with us, 529s, accounts set up for grandkids. And it's usually, this is a small, small sampling, but it, sometimes we'll see clients with 20 plus accounts, including bank savings, CDs, bonds. Um, this is a great place to actually list uh, your beneficiaries and contingent beneficiaries. I, I know it's been helpful for me. I'll open it up and uh, just being able to see where everything's going, share it with your spouse, share it with the attorney, CPA. It's just a nice little feature that's available to you. So that's really for your own planning. Ultimately important to keep in mind that you wanna make sure that things are current with the uh, custodian or holder of the account, uh, the, the bank or whatever it might be. Okay, um, Scott, thanks so much. A lot of good things for us to keep in mind. Um, let's turn our attention to some financial planning strategies and to accomplish that, um, we're gonna to turn to Jeff Perry and Jeff Tamanang, uh, who will lead us through this section, guys. Well, thank you. Um, off of what Scott was saying, he alluded to having some money, some liquid money that during times of high recession or high inflation, that this down markets generally, if you're taking withdrawals to meet your cash flow needs, if you're taking withdrawals from your retirement assets, from your investments, and the market's down, it's not an exciting time to be taking money out of your investments while the market's down. So we highly recommend you have a liquidity bucket. And no, we don't want it in a glass jar, <laughs> but we do want you to have money put aside. If you're in retirement, one to three years of money that's in short-term instruments, that is very liquid, you can get at it when you need it, and you won't be taking your money from your investments during what during down markets. And the general rule for people who are working, still working, still saving, we want you to have a three to six month emergency fund in place. But if you're a retiree, we want you to have that one to three years of your expenses set aside. And you know the size of your emergency fund, the size of your liquidity fund if you're in retirement is really personal. And we can help walk through that 
as we do your financial plan and we see what your income is, what your monthly costs are, how much assets you have generally, dependents, and your lifestyle. What type of lifestyle do you want? The, the general message is have, even when you're working, have an emergency fund for those unexpected things. And when you're in retirement, have that liquidity fund, which is like an emergency fund, but it's there for you to draw from during these ups and downs of the market when the market is down. So think short-term for liquidity buckets. And examples of short-term where you wanna park your money is money market accounts, maybe high yield savings, short-term bonds. We know these offer a low level of return and it's not real exciting to put, if you're retired, one to three years of money in a low area, area of return opportunities, but it's worth it having a highly liquid and flexible account that you can get to very easily when you need it. And for example, if you had one of these liquidity funds during the down market, and when the market was at its lows, you could say, okay, I'm leaving my investments where they are. I'm not taking withdrawal from my investments. I'm not locking in those low prices. I'm going to take it from that liquidity jar and not have to take those withdrawals at lower prices. Short term. Sorry, I think I hit that twice. No, we're good. Okay. So Scott alluded to it, but we all know that inflation is um, upon us. And it's very, we feel it every day when we go to the grocery store, especially we've seen it in our gas prices. We've seen it when we're booking airline trips and it can be, be very stressful. It can put a lot of pressure on your cash flow. You may have a financial plan in place. You may believe that you're able to meet your needs with your cash flow, but inflation can put pressure on your cash flow. So just, this is really basic common sense, but it's good to review. When you have pressure on your cash flow, you have one of two choices. You can increase your income, the top line, your inflows. And if you're on Social Security, you're going to receive a better than average, a pretty aggressive cost of living adjustment, which should help. And while not right for everyone, a reverse mortgage or a HELOC might be something you want to consider. It's really personal. It's really dependent on your situation. But there, if you have a paid off house, especially, or one with a lot of equity, a reverse mortgage is right for some of our clients. Perhaps you have a life insurance policy with some cash value. Now, most of us purchase life insurance at certain times of our life for certain specific needs, things we don't have the assets to take care of in case, some, in case you should pass away. But those times may be over. You may still have this life insurance policy with a cash value that you could cash in and not only not have to pay the premiums if you still are, but get the cash value out of that. Chris, we've lost the slides on the screen. Oh, really? Yep, or I have anyway. Uh, sorry about that, hang on a second. So on, on the life insurance part of it, ask yourself, do you still need what you, the reason that you bought the life insurance in the first place, is it still there? And if you don't have that need and there's some cash value, you might want to consider that. And we can help model that out for you and see what it looks like. And there's also part-time work. More and more people in their retirement are going back to work, not only to put some extra dollars in their pocket and help their cash flow, but they're finding it rewarding and giving them value and being social. So those are things that you can increase the top line, increase your cash flows on a positive side. You're seeing you the screen now, correct, Chuck? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. You also have options on the expense side. So when your cash flow is tight and maybe you can't increase the top line, you can look at the bottom line. And it's an excellent opportunity to review your budget items. Now, for the people who have are my clients or hear me on the radio, you're going to know that I'm always suggesting that everyone has a budget. Not, not You may be a very wealthy individual with excess cash in your monthly cash flow, but I still encourage you to have a budget so you can see exactly where your money's going. And as you review your spending, you may find things in there that you're paying for that you don't need any longer. You know, some of the most frequent things that we find when we're helping clients go through their cash flow is subscriptions that they've purchased, that old gym membership. Maybe they have four or five streaming services and they're only watching one. Maybe they belong to some food 
subscription service that they're really not getting their money's worth anymore. Whatever it is, if you go through your budget items and go through your spending, looking at your checking account, odds are you're going to find things that you're paying on a reoccurring basis that you don't want or don't need any longer. And you can also reduce your discretionary spending. Maybe you have a vacation planned. Maybe you're doing gifting to your children or charitable organizations. Those are wonderful things to do. And of course, we want you to enjoy your retirement, enjoy your life. But if your cash flow is being challenged by inflation, these are things that maybe you can cut back on or delay, including large purchases. If you were buying a new car every 10 years or every five years, well, we know the prices of cars are up right now. If your car is still working, maybe you delay that. Maybe you delay a home renovation until you have a better handle over your cash flows. Now, here's one that's very personal. It's not just a financial decision, it's a really deeply personal decision, and I understand that. But many folks, as they enter retirement or in retirement, consider relocating or downsizing. And it's a good time to at least consider it, especially if your cash flow is being challenged. Real estate prices are still high. Perhaps they're not at the peak as they were, but they're still high. They've had some good gains over the last couple of years. If you were to sell your larger, more expensive home, and move to a smaller, more modest home, you would be eliminating any mortgage perhaps that you had. And if you had extra cash proceeds from the sale, you could eliminate other debt, just help, thus helping your cash flow. You could improve your liquidity, your savings, and your investments by this extra cash. And on an ongoing basis, you could reduce your property taxes, your insurance, and your utility costs that may come with a larger home. And you could maybe avoid some needed repairs and renovations. Maybe you know that five years you're gonna need a new roof or a new furnace. If you consider downsizing now, you might be avoiding those. And strictly on a non-financial decision, you could be moving to a place that you actually wanna live. You could be going to a warmer climate, maybe closer to family, maybe closer to friends. Maybe you wanna have a more active lifestyle in retirement. So certainly not something for everyone, but I think it's worth it if you're having cash flow problems and you're looking for maybe a different place to live, now could be the time to consider downsizing your home. Um, Jeff, it's also you... worth thinking about as people age their their needs for one floor living or you know, similar different kinds of circumstances can arise. So that can also factor into that as could be helpful in giving thought to getting the right situation if they don't have that yet. Very, very common. Yeah, I, I know people myself who, because of stairs, they don't go to the second floor. They're just not using right. it. So it's, right. a, it's, a, it's a difficult decision, especially if it's a family home or a generational home. There's lots of factors. But if you're considering this and you're working with us as a client, or if you'd like to work with us with a client, this is something that we can model out for you, you know, get a good handle of the cost, the benefits, the, uh, the downsides to it. It's worth an it's worth a discussion if you're in that type of situation. Jeff T, you want to take it from here? Sure, thanks, Jeff. Um, I think what uh, one of the things with uh, interest rates rising since the beginning of the year, I think it's important to be aware of any loans that you may have that have variable interest rates, and these could be credit cards on which you're carrying a balance other personal loans, or even an adjustable rate mortgage. So just make sure to read the terms of your loan agreement to understand how the rate is set. Uh, take a look at inflation and you know, pay attention to the Fed um, and see how that, infects, how that affects the interest you're paying. Um, you may want to consider paying down those variable interest rate loans or even refinancing them to a fixed rate um, in a rising in a rising interest rate environment. Uh, so be mindful of any recent or anticipated price increases that you see coming. I mean, we are in an inflationary environment. Um, <clears throat> be aware of the interest rate changes, and you may even consider speeding up any financing of an upcoming purchase, like a car or home improvement. Um, if you believe the interest rates are going to go up and you're going to be making that purchase anyway, let's say a few months from now, you may be able to lock in 
even though interest rates have gone up, a lower interest rate than you might have a few months out. Um, <clears throat> Jeff talked a little about if you had extra cash. Um, and the key here is if you have cash and savings that exceeds what you need in an emergency fund, um, this could be a good time to invest it, uh, to take advantage of the low valuations that are out there. Um, it also might make sense for you to purchase Series I bonds from the U.S. Treasury Department. You know, as of today, they are paying over 9%. And you can just do this by going directly to treasurydirect.gov. Just want you to be mindful of their holding period requirements, any purchase limits, and, er and early liquidation penalties. Yeah, unfortunately, this is not something that uh, advisors can do for you in your brokerage account. Uh, if you want I-bonds, you have to go directly to Treasury Direct. Yeah, again, treasurydirect.gov. Um, it's a wealth of information there as well. Um, check out the CD rates at your local bank or search online at bankrate.com to earn more interest on your cash and savings balances. Um, you know, if you can squeeze out uh, a little more interest, why not do it at uh, with no risk? Um, see what's out there. Like I said, start with your own institution first and your local institution, and then you can also see what's available out there um, on, on the internet at bankrate.com. Uh, Something else to consider, there are multi-year guaranteed annuities. They're fixed annuities that are issued, issued by insurance companies, and they may offer higher rates than CDs. Uh, just have to be aware of any restrictions on withdrawals, and most importantly, make sure that the surrender periods on those contracts don't exceed your time horizon. For instance, don't buy a three-year CD or annuity contract if you think you're going to need the money before the end of that three-year term. Um, you could also consider employing a fixed income laddering strategy. So maybe you have, I don't know, CDs at three years, two and a half years, two years, one and a half years uh, to help mitigate interest rate risk and maybe even reinvestment risk. Uh, but, you know, there are some, you might be sacrificing some liquidity, as we were saying earlier, because if you have a two year CD, and you need the money in six months, you might be paying a penalty to get to it. Um, you know, one of the things to take in mind is if you do something like that, you really need to pay attention. You might have different accounts, different CDs, um, different contracts. So there could be, it, it could move you away from the simplifying your financial life. Just be aware of that when you uh, consider that particular strategy. You know, it, I'd also say that in, in a volatile market like we've had this year, it's important to, you know, you want to rebalance your investment and retirement accounts. Um, you know, here at AMR, we proactively handle that uh, for our clients where we have discretion with our discretionary portfolios, we're managing the money on your behalf. But we know that some some of you may have assets held elsewhere in, uh, let's say, a 401k or in trust accounts elsewhere. A um, few things to remember to just you know, take a look at your target asset allocation, what you started with, and what your overall investment philosophy is, and make sure that that portfolio is still aligned with um, your original targets. Um, Identify the holdings that you've retained just because they had low cost basis. Um, let's say you inherited or received gifts of stock that had low cost basis. If those valuations are low, if they're down from their highs, this might be a good time to sell them, um, you know, reduce your position in a particular stock. Um, and you'll you'll realize lower gains, and you might be able to reinvest those those assets and further diversify your investments. Uh, you can also harvest short-term losses, selling securities at reduced capital gains. Um, 
what that means is let's say you had a stock that was that had a that's down let's say 20 points off the high and then you're able to sell that perhaps realize, realize the loss from where you bought it and then write off that loss but you have to be aware of what are called wash sale rules and um there is a three thousand dollar ordinary income offset limit on those capital losses but if you have any other questions please reach out to us we can uh, go into that in greater detail uh, but most importantly i would say <laughs> try to be disciplined and take a long-term view because it's it's easy in down markets to get nervous and and jump off of the boat <laughs> when you really need to just hold your position and remember that down markets also give you an opportunity to buy those shares at a lower value. So try to be prudent, keep a long-term view. And as point, I said uh, earlier, these are things that we, we do here at AMR for you. Yeah. To your point, Jeff, I mean, tax loss harvesting, uh, think of it as a consolation prize. Um, Right. It's, you know, you can reposition from a position that's down, perhaps um, buy a similar alternative to just take advantage of the tax benefit to allow you to uh, realize other positions that have gained considerably, or it can allow you to reposition into another investment. And as you said, these are things we do routinely with our uh, discretionary accounts. Um, a couple of other things. This is a good opportunity for you to make contributions to a uh, traditional IRA, a Roth IRA, or even your company retirement plan. Um, consider doing this or increasing your contributions since uh, you know the market is down since the beginning of the year. Um, you know, when you're doing dollar cost averaging, you're able to buy shares at a at an average lower value. Um, you know, do you have a traditional 401k or IRA? Uh, if you do, maybe this is a time for you to convert those assets to a Roth IRA. While the market's down, you would pay less in taxes because the market's down. Um, and you know, when those assets come back, at least you can realize those gains in the future tax-free. Um, and then also, if your income is decreased, you may have more room in your tax bracket to do those Roth conversions. Um, so let's say you, you know, your your income has gone down from your investments, or for be, because of uh, the economy, maybe your income is decreased, whether it's from your job or other sources of income. Again, you might have more room to uh, do those Roth conversions without. Uh, taking as much of a tax hit. People considering that kind of a strategy may want to uh, sit down uh, with Scott in our uh, virtually uh, with our uh, in terms of our financial planning modeling to see how the benefits might uh, outweigh taxes. Is it worth it uh, or not? As a part of the evaluation of that consideration. We love this slide. Uh, the question, question we often get is, should you pay down or pay off your mortgage? And sometimes the, you know, what is prudent financially isn't always aligned with what you want in your heart or in your mind. Um, you know, someone might have a two point eight percent mortgage and obviously that's a rate that is well below the the current market levels at this point and so you're not paying much interest but if you have that extra cash you know you might want to consider paying that off not necessarily for financial reasons but because there's that emotional feel of um you know, getting that debt off of your books and just saying, hey, I own this outright. I own this home outright. And, you know, those are those are things I just 
think it's important you you should be aware of. Um, yeah, Jeff, think, do you uh, have anything to add on that? Well, you're right, Jeff. <laughs> it's always a uh, it's always just not as simple as a math equation. It should be a goal of most people as they're getting near retirement to, to live debt free. But when you actually put the brain on it and you, if you have especially one of those two point something percent mortgage rates, and if you're near the end of the amortization schedule, it's really a math problem. And it doesn't always dictate that you should pay off the mortgage, even if maybe your heart wants to. It's, it's really something you should talk to your financial advisor about and you can model it both ways and make an informed decision. I like to, uh, you know, tell people that there's not necessarily a right answer. You know, one can be driven by the arithmetic. Oh, what will I be doing with that money? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, will I right. get a better rate of return? But sometimes there is just a peace of mind benefit. And I think, again, if we put this into the context of modeling out how it affects the financial plan, uh, is, is it materially create an impact? If the answer is yes, that's worth considering. If the answer is not material, if it's a modest impact and it gives one greater peace of mind, then that can be the answer as well. So um, this is probably the most often asked question we get. So guys, thanks so much for those strategies and tips. Uh, I'd like to bring um, Mike Perna into the conversation now with a little bit more perspective. Uh, Mike, uh, there's been just so much bad news that people have been paying attention to and uh, creating anxiety. Um, maybe uh, there's some things to be uh, focused on that can give people a little bit of hope too. Chris, um, that's absolutely right. I mean, I've been in the business uh, for over 40 years. I've seen markets high, I've seen markets low. Um, in fact, uh, when I was an investment manager, I experienced the 1987 meltdown um, and, and that was very uh, unpleasant. Um, you know, it's human nature to get upset, to be worried, to be nervous when you see your investments going down. Your investments are your security blanket in this world. And then when you get the statement and you see it down, and it, it's a bad feeling. It, it's a bad feeling for me, even though I've been in the business for a long time and know that it'll bounce back. It's still an uncomfortable feeling. Um, but I, I make reference to what Warren Beff, Buffett said, never bet against America, he wrote, uh, in his 2021 letter to shareholders, in its brief 232 year, years of existence, there has been no incubator for unleashing human potential like America. Despite some severe interruptions, our country's economic progress has been breathtaking. Our unwavering conclusion, never bet against America. Okay, and I think that's so important and something that I always think of when I start to feel down about the stock market. Okay, and what, uh, one of the main reasons that America has done, you know, so well economically, you know, has a lot to do with the assets that America brings to the equation, but also the immigrants who come to this country and they thrive on the opportunity. 60% of the most highly valued high-tech companies were co-founded by either first or second generation immigrants. People we know like Elon Musk, Sergey Brin, Steve, Stephen Jobs. 40% of businesses on the Fortune 500 were started by either newly arrived immigrants or their children. And 25% of all companies are founded by immigrants. Immigrants only comprise 13% of the US population. If you ever go to New York City and you walk the streets or you take an Uber or a cab, chances are great that you're gonna be talking to an immigrant. They come to this country, they find opportunity and they run with it. So what, what do we have that 
we can, you know, um, look at and say, this is why immigrants come, this is why America has survived, and why it has thrived. If we could turn the page here. Okay, because there's a stable government, despite what happened last year in January. We have great research universities, an abundance of raw materials, an extensive transportation system, a highly developed communication network, a history of welcoming immigrants, and may I add, legal immigrants. There's certainly been issues with illegal immigrants. But there's also a can-do spirit okay, that this country has been imbued with. So what does the future look like? Okay. We're on the cusp of the greatest breakthroughs in the history of the world. Biotechnology in the Boston area, Harvard University has uh, purchased much of Alston, which is a, a part of Boston, and they're building lab spaces there. This is happening in Providence and New York and all over the country. Okay, biotechnology um, in the future will dwarf, dwarf whatever high technology has been able to accomplish. There's artificial intelligence, electric vehicles, driverless automobiles, alternative energy sources, robotics, infrastructure upgrades, climate control innovations, space travel. These are all things we're on the cusp okay, of developing further. So there's so much opportunity and so much going for the future that I go back to what Warren Buffett said, don't bet against America. Mike, thanks for that perspective. I think, you know, it's it's important for us to sometimes uh, we get caught up in looking at all the anxieties in our midst that it's helpful to have a little bit of that enthusiasm and uh, op optimism about what the future holds for the uh, economy and, and for investors long term. Uh, yeah. With that, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that even in the current situation where inflation has been, uh, you know, a nagging problem, the economy has still done well. Okay, there are, companies are still making money. Unemployment is still low. Okay, so I think once we get past this inflation bugaboo, things are going to be looking a lot brighter. Um, I totally agree, and and uh, we certainly hope that happens quickly. Uh, let's use this opportunity for some questions from our audience and uh, our, our participants. Uh, thank you for being with us throughout the commentary. If you'd like to ask a question, there's two ways to do that, um, three ways really. You can uh, write a Q&A in the Q&A section. You can write something in the, the chat area, or you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question verbally. With that, um, let me... Uh, uh, turn our attention to Scott, um, Scott Birmingham. We did have a question from uh, David who said, uh, how does the Monte Carlo scenario analysis deal with surprises and uh, tipping points where the financial system goes from one state to a new un unforeseen one? Uh, I have been uh, taking an online course in the systems thinking and scenario analysis where the instructor focuses on climate change responses and our natural and socioeconomic systems. So the idea of there are, certainly there are these black swan events or unforeseen things that may not be accounted for in a, um, in a Monte Carlo scenario, correct? Uh, I'm going to answer that a few different ways. So if we're talking like an event of 2008 financial crisis, uh, there are fat tail scenarios where there, that is an extreme example but that can be factored into those thousand simulations. If you're thinking, and I think this question may be more of a long-term scenario. So uh, also it will throw in time frames of say the stock market crash of 1929 and the 10 years after that or from 2000 to 2009, which had uh, essentially an annualized negative return referred to as a lost decade. That can also be factored in your Monte Carlo scenario because I, th I think 
I think in this question, you're thinking climate change, how that might affect our financial systems and markets and growth. And then I'll add the third way, I'll kind of answer that uh, back in December, uh, we went in and reduced our projected future returns per asset class. So um, client could have large cap value, small cap, international, whatever it may be. And there's kind of medium returns assigned to each. We went in thinking that going over past historical numbers, they were a little too robust looking forward. So we went in and slightly reduced all of those, those returns so that we would get a more conservative projections for clients. So there's multiple different ways it's, it's it's projecting there, but the Monte Carlo does take care of a big events and then extended down time frames. I hope that answers the question. Uh, very good, thank you. I don't know if anybody else had anything they wanted to add to that. Feel free to chime in if you do. Um, and again, if you have a question, uh, please uh, type it into the Q&A area at this time. David, I hope that answered your question. I think the, the bottom line is um, there are things we cannot uh, plan for or project, certainly that may be the unforeseen. Um, we you know, make certain assumptions and uh, in the way we do our modeling. And as Scott said, there are times we try to alter those, adjust those assumptions given circumstances to try to make them most, what we think is most likely to be uh, useful and predictable for people to, for accuracy. In any case, um, looks like there are not presently any other questions. Um, then at this time, I'd like to thank everyone for their participation in joining us. Uh, we will be posting this uh, webinar on our website. Uh, keep in mind as well that um, you know if you'd like to participate in our upcoming uh, economic and market update, we have that scheduled for October 12th at 10 a.m. At that time, we will certainly be giving additional insights into our outlook on what's happening in the economy and how that may be factoring into our portfolio designs. Um, in the meantime, um, I would like to uh, thank all our, our panelists. Thanks everybody for your uh, insights and sharing your thoughts. And um, if people have questions, they're more than welcome to reach out to us through our uh, website amrfinancial.com uh, or they can certainly give us a call and we'd be happy to hear from you if you would like to review your financial plan any aspects of your portfolio or other variety of things dealing with your own personal planning we'd be happy to talk to you with that uh, we will complete our program today and thank you for joining us